I'm a follower. Walt Whitman's my favorite poet, and Walt Whitman, to paraphrase, says, anyone is a poet who, when he breathes into a thing, no matter how small, it dilates with the grandeur of the universe. I think that's what artists do. I, th I think your job, my job, all of us who are artists, is to expand things. And then sometimes we bring it back together a little bit, and sometimes we expand it again. Uh, speaking of in terms of the collective and uh, fusion. My first poetry reading was given in Whitesett Hall in the art department in the gallery in 1981. Uh, first one where I just didn't get up at a poet open poetry reading and say a poem. So this is kind of a collective fusion circle for me. Uh, there was a, uh, an artist there named Bert Keeney at the time. And uh, I sang, a, one, I write songs. I want to sing you at least part of this song that he came up to me and thanked me for later. I'm going to do it um, a cappella. This is based on working as a therapist in the psychiatric ghetto in Chicago back in the 80s. But it kind of transfers to any kind of stigma, any kind of looking at uh, earlier, uh, our first speaker talked about people wanting to be over there, us and them, the other side, you know, that kind of thinking. And this is about diagnosing people with a diagnosis and then treating them that way. I noticed, this is my first job out of college, that, you know, if they come in with a diagnosis of paranoia, well, I'm going to treat you like a paranoid. <laughs> if you come in with a diagnosis of depression, I'm going to treat you like you're depressed. So I developed a scheme where I didn't get the diagnosis before I talked to people. I, it's like I want to meet the person first and try to see who they are before, because like all of us, you get a label, we will all respond to the label. So this is kind of uh, the person responding back as the, the uh, talking back to me as the person who's in counseling. What is to be expected when there is no borderline? What's to be distinguished when you can't find space and time? And the freedom of insanity lures like a golden star in the sweet depths of humanity. Do you know who you are? I'm just alone and hungry. Oh, don't judge me insane. Can't you see the absurdity of keeping up this way? My mind gets lost in places where the demons dance and shout. I'm just looking for a solid wall to feel my way back out. The patient says to me, you know we're not so different, my friend, you and I. You got your madness and I sure as hell got mine. <laughs> Only mine's got a definition and yours is yet to be revealed. Mm -hmm in fear of its contagiousness, in truth beneath your shield. Aren't you just alone and hungry? Should I judge you insane? Can't you see the absurdity of keeping up this way? Does your mind get lost in places where the demons dance and shout? And aren't you looking for that solid wall? Feel your way back out. So don't channel me by consensus and to not being free to explore the world of my fantasy and find what I can be. And don't try to make me wonder if I should do things your way. Just listen to my story and say you'll let me stay because I'm just alone and hungry. Don't judge me insane. Can't you see the absurdity of keeping up this way? My mind gets lost in places where the demons dance and shout. I'm looking for a solid wall to feel my way back out. So I mentioned earlier that I get inspired by my grandma, who was a quilter. I'm deep in the earth here. My Ancestors uh, up north of here settled in Cato pre-Civil War, okay? That was one side of my family. The other side of my family immigrated when the coal mines were discovered here and worked in the coal mines. So I am born and bred and in the DNA in this area. This is a poem, I mentioned quilting and how I was inspired by my grandmother. The, I wrote this poem and then as I was working on it, I came out to the art department. They had a quilt show going on in Whitesett, 
and then I took down the names of the quilts, and I said, oh, that will f that'll flow into a poem wonderfully. So you'll hear all these names of quilts as you go through this. This is about, basically, when I went, uh, before I went to Chicago, I had the good sense to go to my grandmother's house. She was in her 80s, stay all night with her, and then go to the quilting circle the next day down at the church. Grandma had 14 children, by the way. She gathers her sewing biscuit, excuse me, she gathers her sewing basket and drives the old Ford up to the bungalow to quilt. Sitting around the frame, she trades the local news and drifts back to when she had a man and children tugged at her apron. Oh, the air hangs fragrant as she leans over her art. The names the quilts have, lover's link, flower garden, bow tie and friendship, water lily, rose, pansy, tulip. The great circle, ocean waves, goose tracks, Road to California, American Beauty, Drunkard's Path. Pinwheel, four patch, star, and necktie, wedding ring, sunbonnet, fruit basket, butterfly. The light shines good in her bones all day long. In the evening, she drives the hill toward home, thinks about her children, and sighs. I. Um, I'm very fortunate that I figured out, because I, I don't know, some of you guys may have changed your majors a couple of times, like me. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was four for me, bouncing through. I was an English major. I love literature. Then I was a, I like working with people. I'm a social work major. And then I go over here, and I'm a, for some reason, I was an economics major for a while. I couldn't, I think it was a good teacher. Man, one teacher, I thought I wanted to do economics till I hit the second teacher, you know? <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> but fortunately, I came out ultimately getting a master's, to two degrees here and a master's degree in counseling. And boy, the art from counseling, what do you do? You sit with this sacred space for people to tell you their stories about their lives. And guess what? Over the years, you know the kind of people who end up coming to me in general? I have a private pra in my private practice. Poets, artists, musicians, or I find it in them once they're there. <laughs> you know, it's there. But I, literally, I've, I did like family therapy on a band last year. You know, they came to see me, just like you, you've, you've read about bands breaking up, staying together, trying to do same thing, just like got relationships, got conflicts, got doing that. Uh, so I'm very fortunate. So I can live in the art world and talk to these people about art. I have a songwriter in. Uh, from the area in, in counseling right now, talking about the struggle to be an artist and make a living, you know? And I'm fortunately found a way to make a living and still be an artist. It's not easy sometimes, you know, to say make a living with your art. You know, the only poet I ever found that could do it that I could, that didn't have a job at a university to teach and get it is Robert Bly, you know, that I ever heard of that could do it. So yeah, they have a joke like, uh, what is it about the only, the only people who are, make less than, than uh, artists or poets, something like that, you know, kind of thing. Um, I want to consider some other things in speaking to you, and that is about being a child and growing up in the, you've seen the strip pits, okay? Uh, I tended to write poems about growing up, a lot of poems about growing up in the strip pits. Here's one where we would eat family gatherings, and uh, a unique thing happened to me. It's a true story. At Uncle Bill's place out by the strip pits, our families came together as the smell of barbecue and honeysuckle hung low across the humid afternoon. I remember once, when I was off from the rest, I saw a bass fly up from the dark water into a column of light, column of light and turn his magnificent eye with such a searching look that I flinched and stood motionless until the last circle touched the tangled shore. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm a, if you, you probably know what a, 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 a introvert is a person who takes most of their energy from being alone and away from people. 
extrovert tends to get most of their energy from being around people. I didn't find out two years. I thought I was just messed up because uh, I'm an ambivert. Yeah, and there's a, there's a great book, you, you read it, called uh, Quiet by Susan Cain. It's a wonderful book. And she talks about that term. There are people who say, I get a lot of energy from being around people, like when I do during the day. I also get up every day at 4 o'clock to have four hours not being around people so that I can meditate, walk, get away from things, don't talk to me. Uh, so that, I found, has been part of being my art. My Art is the way that I learn to say, like, I pull away into writing into that world and do that part when I'm more when I'm an introvert, I can do all that. Uh, part of doing an introvert for me is writing poetry, and here's one that I wrote about. I told you one part of my family was uh, came at the turn of the century to dig coal. I had a grandpa who uh, was about the most amazing guy I ever met because he came over here and started at 12 years old working in a coal mine on his hands and knees because the, the coal seams here were only this high, okay? And then all the way through, he was just a happy-go-lucky guy. But he was a digger. He was known as the best coal digger, and other people told me this growing up in the area. And so I used to watch him observing digging, and I wrote this poem called Digging about Grandpa. I hear the clean, rhythmic sound of his sharpshooter shovel, 16-inch blade, ash, and steel handle, easing down into clay, his straining back in a deep hole, descending to a sewer line or water main, or out back in the garden with a long-handled shovel, stooping and standing in rhythm, boot to heel, wood on knee, blade sliding in, arms levering dark earth up, over, over, digging. Oh, Grandpa could handle a shovel. He consistently dug more coal in a day than any other man in any of the southeast Kansas mines he worked. And following that, he dug graves, graves for horses, footings for buildings, troughs for water, sewer and gas lines, gardens, and deep ditches in searches of, for broken sewer pipe, heaving sod and clay and rock to one side or over his shoulder, going down down, down, digging. He smiled and whistled between his teeth, digging narrow trenches for new gas lines near our house, happy to be standing and shoveling above ground in clean air and sunshine, rather than on his hands and knees 150 feet down in foul, dark air, picking and shoveling coal from a three-foot seam. In the easy way, he carried his tools, long-handled shovel, sharpshooter, pick, double-bladed axe from the bed of his pickup to the plumb line and set about his work digging. The moist smell of new earth, the rasp and thump of clay, the slice of edge through roots, the economy of motion, sewer line, water line, gas line, garden, ditch, grave, digging. I write a column for the newspaper now for 21 years, uh, back to collective memory. Uh, Jean de Grusen, God rest his soul, who's been gone over 10 years now, uh, used to be special collections librarian here, poet and writer, supporter of the arts uh, extraordinaire. After I, I'd written about four or five columns, they're mostly true stories, reflections on the area. He said, thank you for keeping the collective history of the area alive. And I went, what? And he noticed it before I did, that history, the collective memory, it's like uh, when you were talking about what we store in our brain, you know, that, but what comes out of my brain from experience and back in, I've had people come up to me who moved here in the last 20 years, he said, you've taught me about the collective memory of Southeast Kansas through your columns. Because reading you tells me what happened here. So again, my art, my being able to be an artist and explore what I really love to do and put it out there is then serving the collective memory of the area when that was not my intention. And how many times does art do that, you know? 
I, I mean, for me, a piece of art, I'm, I'm, I'm a junkie. You know what I'm saying? I'm walking down the street at four in the morning with my dog, and then I say, man, look at that. That's, it's, the, it's the asphalt in a, you know, come on, Arlo, look at that. What is, <laughs> you know, I, I see it everywhere. Uh, you know, art just is, surrounds me. I have to watch I don't get too overstimulated with looking at patterns and things, but it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have as a sense of art for yourself. Somebody was in my office yesterday uh, who was struggling with some issue in counseling, and she said, my family members say I'm too sensitive. Anybody ever told you that? You're too sensitive. Artists tend to be sensitive. You've got to have a, I call it a thinner, a thinner membrane with the world. I mean, you know, and it's hard to pack that. That's part, part of why I like working with artists, because they need reinforcement. It's okay to have that thin membrane, you know, but you have to kind of decide when, what kind of people you can put it out against. You know, don't listen to those people. Robert Bly, one of my favorite poets, this is called being shamed for being an artist or a poet. Don't let people do that to you. For any reason in general, but especially for art. Robert Bly uh, was at a reading in Kansas City, and he said this. A man walked up to him, and he said, I didn't like your last book as much as your first one. And he said, oh, are you trying to shame me? <laughs> and the guy said, well, no, I wasn't trying to shame you. And Robert Bly goes, well, thank you very much then. <laughs> And <laughs> he did this little dance, and I've always thought that goes great with people. It's like, you know, people trying to shame you or like shooting an arrow at you, and you can go, miss me? Hi. And, you know, I do Tai Chi in the morning, and Tai Chi is about not being resistant and taking the blow. It's about letting it miss you. And it's about life, you know? You don't have to take that arrow that people are shooting at you, and that's what I teach people a lot about. It's like, hey, you know? Give it back. Nope, thanks. No, I get it. Um, I was also fortunate. A friend of mine named Rosemary Postai uh, graduated with a master's degree in art from this institution. And years ago, she did her master's, I guess, presentation. What do they call it? A show? An exhibition. exhibition in wearable art. She was an incredible seamstress. So she made all these costumes for women, you know, to wear, and, we, and then I wrote poetry for it, and we put on a whole show, just like a Broadway show with wearable art and music, and think it was great. I want to read you a couple, a little short, they're kind of almost like uh, haiku poems from pieces of her art. One's called Swan, and one's called Heart. Two Women in Rosemary. Swan. Your feathers, curtains blowing outward from the dark window of spring, your lover climbs through just to see you turn your head. Blinding water watching, no shortage of void in you. Heart, oh heart, hung in a black steel ring. Heart, queen of the vanity table drawers no one can open. So this is a more contemporary poem that uh, this bounces me back. So I was at the back and I, I live close enough that I can go home and eat lunch and come back to work. So a lot of times I stop at the convenience store there at Joplin and Jefferson, you know, get a Coke. I was in there one day, one summer, and I walked in and there was some, so I'm, this is a few years ago, so I'm about 64, and these are teenagers of 14, 15, and they got a different energy than I do, you know? But it pushed me back to my energy just being around them. So here's a poem about that. At the convenience store on Jefferson and Joplin, a boy and a girl, maybe 15, open faced by a Dr. Pepper and a Coke. Song blares on the radio, girl sings along. Oh, hell yeah, oh, hell yeah. Outside, the summer air echoes a sweet, lonely day in 1965 at Blue Sea Strip Pit. The Cotsman brothers, eyes innocent, smiles dreamy, 
singing along with my AM transistor radio. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. But I try and I try and I try and I try. <laughs> the beauty of adolescence. Trying to get some satisfaction. Uh, I, where is that little device? In my pocket by this, uh, right here, by this transmitter thing, is a track phone, which is far as I'll go. <laughs> I only have that phone because I am the caregiver for a 91-year-old mother and a 55-year-old brother over in Frontenac, and I have to be available. Otherwise, when I get them in assisted living, I'm going to take that track phone and go out to the strip pit and go t -t 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 -t. <laughs> I came up in an era where we didn't, leave the, we didn't need these things, and I don't think I need it. You know, it's, I really don't think I do. I just think uh, it's something that interrupts my flow uh, if I've got to be it on. And I don't keep it on a lot. And don't text. Don't do a lot of things. But it is a nice tool when you take a trip. I don't want to say it's not there, but I wrote this poem. It's funny how you never, it's funny how you never really appreciate electronic devices until they die. My smartphone died today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I grew up in the era of Vietnam. We were having demonstrations when I was some of your guys' age, right out there on the Oval, uh, against the war, against the bombing. Uh, it was a difficult time. A lot of our friends were getting killed. It was a, kind of a strange thing. We had compulsory ROTC, so I had to take ROTC for two years and then go out and take my uniform off and go protest the war. You know, I had friends lost there. This is a story f about the pain of war. The wars now, the men that are going, and it was not a matter of judging the people who came and want, you know, men are put in that position and women and their families and they suffer a lot. The, you mentioned PTSD, you know, that the soldiers go through. I've treated a lot of s soldiers yeah, over the years. I've worked inpatient and addiction units in different places. Uh, this is a story, true story taken from somebody's experience when I was working in an inpatient addiction unit. I was eight when my dad came back from Vietnam, wounded in action. With my crayons, I made a sign that said, my dad is a hero. And I walked the streets of our Wichita neighborhood, tall and proud. Some guys stopped their car, slapped me around, and tore up my sign, called my dad a baby killer. My mother crushed half a Valium and fed it to me, told me, stop crying. A few weeks later, my dad and I were driving in the car when he heard a backfire and dove under the dashboard, trembling and wide-eyed. He made me promise never to tell anyone. From then on, I knew things would never be the same. I have a, uh, here's how the world works. I, I got into addiction counseling uh, kind of sideways, but I really liked it because when you go into addictions counseling, it's all based on let's start telling the truth now because you've been lying and manipulating, playing games, you know, to get around your addiction. You know, it's a, it's a disease, and we got a lot of it in this country. We've got to pay attention and treat people with love and respect, good boundaries, but, you know, they're no different than anybody that's got diabetes. Their behavior gets funky, funkier than some people with diabetes, but it's real. Well, God blessed me with a couple of sons with it, too, after I learned all about it. I don't know how that works. Universe, Allah, God, Yahweh. This is for my son who suffers from addiction and depression. You're woven into the puzzle of my heart, the jigsaw I try and try to put together. I'm afraid beneath the half moon of early 
Kansas morning of not finding all the pieces. I know that something in you hurts, and I know that you've carried it bravely. Can you see the shadow on my face that carries it with you? Fatherhood. Huh? Um, let's do a little hitchhiking. You guys ever, they don't hitchhike anymore. We got to finish up. Where are we finishing up? It's, who's up next? We need to get you up here. Uh, I don't think I'd hit. Well, let's do this. One last poem. This is an art poem, love poem. Let's finish with a love poem. Got art in it, since we're talking art department. Riddle of fishes for Linda. Come, touch me in my abstract, dripping blue love, bird singing in the dead of day, reaching wordless places long forgotten. Your beauty, why our pain? The riddle of fishes cut from lines of fight only to swallow new hooks. I love you. I love you in the corners of paintings where the artists ran out of space. So much more to paint and out of space. Thank you. <laughs>